Hello, I'm Wilson Harwood and welcome to this lesson on how to design a Dolby Atmos room focusing mostly on the acoustics, which I don't think it gets talked about enough out there. So before I jump in, I do have a free resource for you. This is my free acoustic treatment guide. It's gonna give you a lot of the basic concepts around how you should treat your room using what I'm talking about in this lesson. So it's a great companion tool as you're watching this to go ahead and download that. You can do that right away at soundproofyourstudio.com slash acoustic. That's soundproofyourstudio.com slash acoustic. All right, I'm gonna jump into this lesson on how to design your Dolby Atmos room. All right, first let's talk about what is Dolby Atmos um, because that's kind of important to understand how it relates to the acoustics. So the thing that's really unique about Dolby Atmos versus surround sound is the idea that it opens up this 3D object placement thing when you're mixing. So instead of having channels dedicated directly to the speaker, you can now pan and three-dimensionally place items like a shaker or a hi-hat or a singer even anywhere in a three-dimensional space around the room, behind your head, down by the floor, up near the ceiling. So it's pretty fun and cool. But with that understanding of using all these different speakers, you have three speakers in the front, two speakers on the side, two speakers over your head, and then speakers behind you, not to mention you also have subwoofer or maybe even two subwoofers. So things get a little crazy when it comes to surround sound in general and especially with Dolby Atmos, where we're now adding speakers above you on the ceiling. So the first thing to talk about when we're getting into the design and the acoustics of your Dolby Atmos room is going to be getting the room ratios and the room geometry right to start with. First, I highly recommend using a rectangular room. Do not use a square room, and honestly, don't work in a room that has irregular shaped walls or walls that aren't symmetrical. All of that is gonna make your life so hard when you're building your Dolby Atmos room. So although people talk about slanting walls in recording studios, it really only helps with flutter echo. And sometimes people say it could help a little bit with standing waves, but honestly, that's not necessarily true. And in reality, the slanting of the walls is just gonna cause more problems with your room. So if you're building an isolation chamber first, make it rectangular. If you're building in an existing room that's not isolated, keep it rectangular still, don't go for crazy slanted walls. With that said, symmetry is extremely important in any mixing control room. This is because your phantom image, in this case, let's talk about stereo first, let's say you have a vocal pan directly front. If your room is not symmetrical, that vocal, even when it's pan center, may sound a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right. And this can cause you to go crazy when you're mixing and listening back to music, and especially in something like Dolby Atmos where everything's three-dimensional, suddenly you might place a shaker behind your head and it's not exactly where you want it to be, and so your whole mix environment is not accurate. Now let's talk about room ratios. This is something that I want you to consider, but not obsess about. You can watch another one of my videos on room ratios, which I recommend right here, that goes in depth into them and how I think they're great and terrible at the exact same time. But essentially using a room ratio from a room calculator like Amrock is a good starting place. If you have the option to change the dimensions of your room, say you're building from scratch or you're adding walls in your build, yeah, why not try to get the room ratios good enough where the room modes from the beginning of your studio build will be better than if you didn't use a room ratio calculator. However, if you're just starting in a basement or a bedroom or a living room or whatever, you might not have the luxury of changing the walls. So screw it, just deal with what you got. One caveat to that is that even Dolby Atmos says there is a limit to the size of the room. If you can't go so small, it just won't work. So in general, you need more volume in the room for acoustics to sound good. The more volume in the room, the better the acoustics will be. So keep that in mind. You can't use like a tiny, tiny 10 by 10 room and expect to get a Dolby Atmos system to work. All right, let's talk about the actual acoustic design. So the way I like to think about this is that we're trying to build a mix room, a control room is the traditional term for that. And control rooms have a long history of design. And so it'd be crazy not to try to borrow from that history with our Dolby Atmos design. So there's two basic concepts. One is the live end dead end control room or mix room. The other is the non-environmental control room or mix room. Now the live end dead end mix room 
is the idea that many home studios employ, which is trying to make the front of the room where you're actually sitting and listening as dead as possible, meaning lots of absorption. But then the back end of the room is more live, meaning lots of diffusion. Now, this might sound great in theory, but there's a lot of downsides to getting an accurate listening position when you have a ton of diffusion on the back of your room, or even worse, just a ton of drywall. And the reason is that you're getting a lot of reflections, and then the diffusion, even though it's helping to disperse the sound field, it's actually causing potential phase issues in the room, and it's making the listening environment maybe sound bigger or more pleasurable, but it's not necessarily giving you the most accurate sound coming from the speakers. And when we're dealing with a Dolby Atmos setup, having diffusion in your back part of your room or on the ceiling, it might sound pleasurable to your ears, but it's not gonna tell you exactly what's going on, and it might cause coloration, phase issues, things like that, distortions in the sound quality coming from your speakers to your listening position. So I usually recommend not doing the live indebted approach if you're trying to get a very accurate mix room. That brings us to the non-environment room. Now, the non-environment room is preferred by designers like Philip Newell, who wrote Recording Studio Design, and is a great thinker and philosopher when it comes to recording studio design. So with the non-environmental room, essentially the idea is that we're going to put absorption on all the walls except for the front wall and the ceiling. So the whole room is very, very absorptive, ideally all the way down to 20 hertz, which is really hard to do. But ideally, in theory, that's what you do. Then the front wall is reflective. It could be something like drywall, but ideally it's actually a really hard surface and ideally your speakers are soffit mounted into that. But with the Dolby Atmos system, we're not gonna soffit mount things right now. So your front wall is really reflective and your floor is reflective, giving life to the room so that you don't go crazy in what's known as an anechoic chamber. An anechoic chamber is where there's no reflections whatsoever in the room and it's the most accurate listening room and it would be great for Dolby Atmos, but the downside is people tend to go crazy in anechoic chambers because they're not used to that environment. We like reflections in the room. So that's usually not a design criteria for recording studios. So now that you know that I'm leaning towards the non-environmental room design, that's what I would recommend that you do. And then you got to figure out how you're going to achieve that level of absorption. So the easiest way is just to buy acoustic panels. Now I lean towards using only quote unquote bass traps, which are just thicker panels, you know, usually in the four to six inch range of insulation with an air gap behind them. And I would use those on your walls because to be honest, we want to control the low frequencies in the room as much as possible. And those panels can get down to about 125 Hertz. Then you want to put the biggest bass traps you can in each corner, meaning the largest amount of space as the bass trap straddles the corner. The more space you're willing to give up, the better your low end frequency response will be in your room. This is especially true when you have like 10 speakers in your room and the sound is bouncing off everywhere and causing chaos in terms of phase cancellations and room mode peaks and nulls and all sorts of standing waves. So we want to absorb that sound as much as possible. Next, you want to put deep panels on your back wall. The deeper the better because sound is coming directly from three speakers in the front of the room towards your back wall. So the more we can absorb and reduce reflections off that back wall, the better. Lastly, we want to hang clouds, absorptive acoustic panels on the ceiling, covering as much of the ceiling as possible to reduce reflections from the floor back to the ceiling and other reflections that have bounced off the room into the ceiling. Now, if you do this well, and if we have those clouds hanging as low as physically possible so that you can get even more maximum base absorption from the acoustic clouds yourself, that is the goal. Now, once you do this, I would set up all your speakers according to Dolby Atmos and test the room, listen to a reference track to make sure that it sounds similar to what a Dolby Re Atmos reference track should sound like, notice how the bass sounds in the room, and you can adjust things slightly as needed. You might find the room to be oppressively dead at first, but I guarantee you it's going to be more accurate than if you added a ton of diffusion panels. And it's better to simply learn how to work in a more controlled environment than to try to replicate an actual living room space that you're used to hearing music in. Lastly, you're going to have to deal with your subwoofer. So place your subwoofer in a place where there's not necessarily a modal peak or null and using a calculator like AMROC can be really help, helpful for seeing where potential room modes might be overly excited and not put the base uh, subwoofer there. Lastly, you can use something like Sonarworks to 
EQ your speakers or something more advanced like Trinov, which is like five grand or something like that. But whatever you do, you can do a little bit of room equalization at the very end if you like. But honestly, if you do what I did said to do in this video, I guarantee you, you're going to get closer to a flat re frequency response than you would with any sort of room uh, ca calculators or equalizers uh, on their own. All right, so in conclusion, we're gonna look at starting with a rectangular room. We wanna look at room modes, but not get overly obsessed with them. We wanna make sure our room is symmetrical. So no odd shapes, no odd, like one wall slanted, the other wall not. That's gonna to totally throw off your Dolby Atmos mix from the start. Then for acoustics, remember I'm leaning you towards the non-environmental design approach. So you can read up on that, learn more about it. And I'm recommending that if you wanna do this on a budget using just typical home studio acoustic panels covering as much of those side walls, back wall, and ceiling as you possibly can afford. And remember the bass traps, the deeper that you can get them into the room with a large air gap behind them, the better your low end control will be. Once you do all that, set up your speakers, test the room, listen to reference tracks, and adjust as you feel comfortable. But remember, adding diffusion is potentially going to cause more problems than good and lead to an a less accurate mixing position. All right, I hope you have enjoyed this lesson on setting up the acoustics for your Dolby Atmos system. And if you have more questions about it, definitely check out that free resource for you. I have the um, acoustic treatment guide that you can download right away at soundproofyourstudio.com acoustic. And if you're in need of a consultant or a designer for this, reach out for a soundproof clarity call on my website at soundproofyourstudio.com. All right, I'll see you all later and have a great week. And I'll see you next week with more information on soundproofing and room acoustics.